Good afternoon, everyone. I could have been a doctor. I even studied science in the school. But my heart lay elsewhere. Because I've been painting since I was three. When I told my parents about uh, my interest, my mom, well, was worried. She had this uh, stereotypical image of a painter in her mind. What do we, I mean, how do we imagine a painter in India? Somebody who wears, who walks bare feet, who wears a long kurta with the splouts of color all over. So I had to promise my mother that it's not going to be like that. Somehow my parents caved in and they let me pursue painting as a subject of study. So soon after, I mean, I started studying. So I started, as luck would have it, I started appearing in the local newspapers. That somehow pacified my parents. And they felt he'll do OK. Soon after my graduation, uh, I walked to them again and said that this time I want to study design. And obviously, they would be worried. So they were. So people uh, in Kashmir didn't understand what design is then. And a lot of them don't understand it even now. <coughs> it was after a lot of convincing that my parents let me go to NID to study design further. So I was born in Kashmir, brought up in Kashmir. And uh, since childhood, I have seen a lot of crafts around me, crafts, textiles. In fact, my neighbor used to embroider gabbas, which are the local rugs of Kashmir. But it was, I mean, though I have seen these crafts in Kashmir, but it was only after studying at NID that I started valuing them. I started valuing the culture, the rich culture, the tradition of textiles, and other crafts. And I decided that I'll study and I'll do more deeper inspection and I'll use these crafts in my work. Kashmir is known for beautiful mountains, water bodies, and enticing mountains. So fresh air, fresh water was not anything new to me as growing up. But imagine a shift from this to th sorry, this. Delhi has been my home for almost a decade now. And we have mountains in Delhi also, in fact. <laughs> so we have uh, beautiful, huge mountains in Ghazipur. And we have mountains filled with fragrance in uh, Okhla. <laughs> and then we have mountains filled with all the rotten stuff at Balsfa. But the proportion of Ghazipur mountain has become enormous. It covers a land of 80 acres. And imagine living behind a big mountain of dump and garbage, which is almost as tall as the iconic Qutub Minar, which is 73 meters high. So the last year's uh, massive fire which broke at Balsfa left the livelihood of the people around it in a mess. So there were poisonous gases carbon emissions, which the inhabitants had to breathe for days together. So the whole environment and the clouds had turned gray. So imagine breathing that poisonous air for days together. So a lot of them have started shifting from the place. They're looking for options. And a lot of them are still struggling to live there and breathe there. But what can we do about it? What ideas do we have in mind?
you must be wondering what I have put there in the slide. So these were my product choices some 10 years back. Plastic toothbrush, plastic bottles, single-use plastic to carry things. I made a conscious choice of using and replacing these products and many more with things like bamboo toothbrush, water bottles like glass or metal, and then fabric carry bags, which stay for longer to carry the stuff. I wanted to actually practice what I teach. And at the same time also see if it's really difficult to uh, take up these choices. So fast fashion, as you know, I mean, factories are producing more, we are consuming more, and the impact is that uh, the carbon footprint is increasing with time. And we are all part of it, contributing to this whole cycle, where uh, the fashion cycles are changing every three months. And in most of the cases, every three weeks. So imagine the amount of surplus goods which we create, and imagine the amount of carbon dioxide and carbon emissions which we are creating, and the carbon footprint we are leaving on this earth. Some of you may have heard, and some of you may not, the unfortunate incident of uh, Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, where the garment workers, almost 1,200 of them lost their lives. So what was the problem? So basically, the factory was working in the conditions that the structure was already weak. So there were cracks in the walls, but the factory still didn't stop operating. This is the price we pay for fast fashion. So, I mean, I was, uh, though I talk about it a lot, the carbon footprint, but do you know about water footprint? So it's the amount of water which is consumed and polluted while making products. So when I got to know that it takes 712 gallons of water, which means almost 2,500 liters of water to create just one shirt. I was dumbfounded. In fact, I thought about how can one shirt contain that much of water? Forget using it and polluting it in the process. You must be thinking, why? You know, why are we talking about this? We had such fun session earlier. Why am I talking about these concerns now, right? Because we have only this planet to live in. There is no planet, right? Environment degradation is the biggest issue of our time. So talk about global warming, air pollution, water pollution, natural source I mean resource depletion. So all of this is happening because of our own habits and practices in our daily life. So you'll be surprised to know that apparel industry, obviously it's the biggest contributor to pollution, only second to oil. But you'll be surprised to know that 10% uh, of total global carbon emission is because of the apparel industries. And you must be thinking, why am I talking about this? What am I doing about it, right? Only changing certain products in my life? Is that going to help? So a few years back, 2017, I started a label called Rafugar, where I have a team of people who have ideas how to churn around, how to not contribute to, to this ever-growing problem. So uh, the name itself, Rafugar, a lot of you may be aware about it, means a darner. So a darner is somebody who heals the fabric. So in a way, this whole thought of that they heal the fabric. And they are the fabric doctors, right? Becoming a doctor here, right? 
So that was a whole thought in my mind. Then we started Rafugar. It's dedicated to the darners who would mend fabric. So what do we do at Rafugar? So these are some of the things. I couldn't obviously put everything in this presentation. But some of the things we do in Rafugar. One is even what I'm wearing today and what I wear every day. So it's totally handloom. So a lot of money which goes to the craftspeople of India itself. And we are also appreciating the human effort, which is unmatched with the power looms and all other industries which are creating pollution again. And there's a rhythmic sound of music when the weaver is working on a loom. So we use either azo free dyes, because if we want to get more colors, so I teach color and I'm a colorist. I told you I was a painter. So we use azo free dyes so that we're not harming the environment anymore. At the same time, we also use a lot of natural dyes. Creating clothes in small batches is another thing. So we, we don't want to be part of the race. We don't want to be fast fashion company or an enterprise. So we create smaller bunches. We customize things so that we don't have too much of surplus left for us to be thrown out in the same landfills. And we have been successful in this. So using zero waste pattern making, which is a technique where you can, the, you can use the whole width of the fabric if you know how to cut it properly and sweep it. So one of the examples in the tradition is, I go back to my state, is the ferron which is a zero waste, androgynous, anti-fit garment. So we try and maximum of our, maximum of our uh, patterns for the clothes are zero waste. Textile waste management is another thing because there's a lot of human effort which goes into making this fabric. There are weavers who are weaving it. There are embroiders who are embroidering it. There are people who are dyeing it. So there's a lot of human effort which goes into it. So we try to, we also term it as textile diamonds and not textile waste. So we save it as a resource for our other collection. So we create every now and then when we have enough textile waste, textile diamonds in our studio. So we segregate it according to the colors, according to the fabric, fiber. And then we try to make small capsule collections out of it. So I'll be showing you a few examples in later slides. We do hand embroidery, we do hand pleating, we do hand weaving. So everything what happens in the studio is about human effort, is hands on and minds on. So I'll be talking about a few of my collections, not everything today. So this was one of our collection called Hakimo. So Hakim in traditional sense means a doctor, a traditional doctor. So that's where the word Hakimo comes from. So we collaborated with one of the studios in Noida to weave the waste back and give it back the life. So give it second chance and second life. And created some ensembles out of it. And for the same, we were also recognized. I think recognition and appreciation is also important. So we got the India's Best Design Award for this particular collection. And was, this collection was also featured in Vogue. Another collection, it's a recent one. It's called Manshur Numa, which means prismatic, no? where we are actually making strips of fabrics, weaving. So what was happening earlier was we were giving it to other studios. So I felt like we are generating carbon footprint again, because it's going from one studio to another, coming back as a new fabric. So what can we do? How can we weave it in the studio itself? So there's an old technique of kaleidoscopic weaving, which we use into making this fabric and giving life to this fabric again. And we created some interesting ensembles out of it. So this collection was again featured in Vogue Italy. So understanding that new fabric, everyone is making garments out of, but the challenge of using which is left out which is in bits and pieces. So we also sometimes embroider with the smaller scraps, which are not, I mean, which we are not able to weave. 
Now, this uh, particular shawl, uh, the inspiration is from Kashmir, from the Jamawar shawls of the Kashmir. So, there was this whole aspect of, uh, I call it digital, where the, you know, after COVID, thought of physical and uh, virtual worlds coming together. So, this whole shawl uses natural dyes, hand weaving, hand embroidery, and even the yarns which the embroidery is done with our wool, merino wool. So it was very difficult to even create it because it took us almost three months to create this piece. And there's a hand pleating in the center. So the colors are mentioned here, what we have used in this particular piece. And this piece soon will be, uh, the exhibition will unveil tomorrow uh, in Melbourne uh, Museum. So what are we doing by making these smaller fabrics out of you know, smaller things or scraps. So this is the annual impact of one studio. So imagine if there are 20,000 studios for putting together energy and maybe not contributing more to the landfills and trying to maybe in their own smaller ways contribute back. So imagine just multiply it by 22,000. So we can at least save a lot of waste going to the landfills. So here I end my presentation with uh, Al Gore quotes it beautifully. He says the future generations will be asking us this question that what were we doing when all of this was happening, when we were stealing their future from them. Thank you. <laughs>